know, there's an old uh, saying that you'll never see a hearse followed by a U-Haul. It's the truth, isn't it? You leave everything. But we usually think in terms of material things, but in fact, we can leave a spiritual inheritance as well. The book of Deuteronomy is like a family photo album for the nation of Israel. It's looking back to the national spiritual heritage that they have. The author is Moses. We know that this is the last book in the Pentateuch, which meant five books. It was written by Moses, and the theme is obedience. You're blessed if you obey. You're cursed if you disobey. And the other message is that your obedience or disobedience is passed on. It impacts many. This book is even called a book of remembrance. Fourteen times God says, remember. Thirteen times he says, don't forget. When we look at our map, we remember that God had taken Abraham's family into Egypt and he grew them into a great nation. And then he brought them out. He delivered them from bondage and took them to Mount Sinai. It was there that in Leviticus, God gave them the law. And then he brought them up to Kadesh Barnea. And unfortunately, unbelief caused them unrest and they wandered for 40 years. In the book of Deuteronomy now, they have moved up east of the Jordan River to the plain of Moab. Much of this book is important for us today. Jesus thought it was important. He even quoted it more than any other Old Testament book. Remember when he was tempted by Satan? Every single time he quoted this book. It's referred to over 80 times in the New Testament. So obviously there's something in here for us today. It's been said that he who forgets the past is doomed to repeat it. And that's the first subject that's covered in this book. Remember the past. If you turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 1, and he starts reminding them of their past. He reminds them and he told them to go into the land and possess it. But look at chapter 1, verse 26. Yet you were not willing to go up, but you rebelled against the command of the, of the Lord, your God. And you grumbled in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt, Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites. Verse 30, the Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight on your behalf as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness. Remember how God carried you just as a man carries his son. But verse 32 says, but for all this, you did not Trust the Lord. In your outline, if you want to fill in the blanks, he's reminding them of man's past failure. He's saying, you were not willing to obey me. You rebelled against me. You grumbled. You didn't trust me. They failed. But he's also reminding them of God's past faithfulness. He says, remember how I even carried you in the wilderness. And when you come over to the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 7, he says those whole 40 years that they were in the wilderness, they did not lack a thing. Chapter 8 even tells us that their clothes didn't grow old and their feet didn't swell. Isn't that amazing? God was faithful to these people. In chapter 4, verse 9, he says, Only give heed to yourself. And keep your soul diligently, so that you do not forget the things that your eyes have seen, and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and grandsons. Now, when you think about it, this book of Deuteronomy is really being written to the new generation. Remember what happened to that old generation? They all died. And so this is being written to people who don't remember the parting of the sea. And so the, the first generation was told to remember those things and not just remember them, but pass them on. I, I've told you that my son Travis was born with a birth defect. His stomach and intestinal tract were outside his body. 
And the doctors had not seen something like this, so they ran home and got a camera. And they took pictures before they operated on him and after. They operated the first day, the third day, the eighth month, the 15th month, and we always had before and after pictures. Because Travis was, it was so miraculous that he survived all this, every year on his birthday, we would get out those pictures and we would say, look what God did. This was the horrible condition we were in and this was how God was so faithful. Now we did it not only to remind ourselves, but to teach him. And that's really what this passage is saying. You need to teach your children because they need to learn from your experiences. But then he goes on in verse 10 to say, remember how the Lord had me assemble the people, this is Moses talking, that, that he would give them his words so that they would fear him all the days of their lives. And he says they were to teach their children. See, they were not only to teach their children about their past experiences, they were supposed to teach their children God's word. As Travis grew up, we used to meet every night on our king size bed, and we would read through the Bible each year. That was our place to study the Bible, to learn together. And it brought great conversation about what had happened that day at school and how the Bible applied to, to what was going on in his life. That's what God was telling them. Remember your past, your past failure, God's past faithfulness. The second section of this book is that it's legal. He gives instructions for their future by repeating the law. Now, of course, he's not repeating it because they've forgotten. He's repeating because this whole new generation wasn't there for the first giving of the law. Deuteronomy actually means second law. It's not a, it's not a new law. It's a repetition of the law given in, in the book of Leviticus. He gives two reasons why they should obey the law. Chapter 4, verse 40 is the first reason. He says, You shall keep the statutes and his commandments which I'm giving you today, that it may go well with you. Now that's a good reason to obey the law. That it may go well with your children after you, and that you may live long in the land which the Lord your God has given you. He says, The first reason to obey the law is your life will go better. That's a good reason to obey God's word, isn't it? In chapter 7, verse 8, he gives a second reason for them to obey the law. He says, Because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your fathers, he brought you out by a mighty hand, he redeemed you from the house of slavery. It goes on to say, he's a faithful God who keeps his commandment and his loving kindness to thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Here's the second reason to obey God, because of love. If you want to fill in the blanks in your workbook, two reasons are life is better and because of love. Deuteronomy is actually the first book that God talks about loving them. Now, he's shown them he's loved them by what he's done for them throughout this uh, Pentateuch. But this is the first time God's actually said, I love you. And he says here, I love you. And if you love me, you'll obey me. And do you notice how he says, love and obey? And many, many times in this book, you'll find those two words in the same verse. Love me, obey me. That's a spiritual principle. God says, if you love me, you'll obey me. So he's saying the second reason to obey God is because we love him. He loves us, therefore we are to love him. Chapter 5, he starts to repeat the law. The second section now is he's repeating the law. He's giving them instructions for living in the land. And he starts the uh, repetition of the Ten Commandments here in chapter 5. Now we know that we can find them in Exodus chapter 20, but they're repeated here for the new generation. And he says in verse 6, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Boy, he repeats that a lot in this book, doesn't he? He wants them to remember what it was like to be in slavery. Do you remember what it was like to be in bondage to sin? He wants us never to forget that to remember his faithfulness in delivering us. 
And the interesting thing is he's about to give them the law, and we tend to think of the law as something that would bind us, right? But he says, no, you were in bondage before. It's free people that he gives the law to because the law, obeying the law, really is freedom. He repeats the Ten Commandments. He repeats the first one about... Um, you shall have no other gods before you. He repeats the second one. You shall not have any idols, for I am a jealous God. He repeats that three times in this book. I'm a jealous God. And you know the word idol in the Hebrew actually means nothing. So he's saying anything that you put in the place of God is like worshiping nothing. Isn't that the truth? And then he tells us in this verse something very important. He says, because... He visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but he shows loving kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. This is a truth we have to understand, that our obedience and disobedience impacts future generations. He says our disobedience impacts three or four generations. Our obedience impacts thousands. And you might say, well, I don't even have any kids. It doesn't matter. Your life is impacting many people. I look at funny grandpa. Grandpa had two children. They both know the Lord. They had three children. All know the Lord. We have four children. One was a Moody Bible Institute graduate. My son teaches Bible studies. God's loving kindness is at work in all their lives. It was a promise that he made. In chapter 6, Verse 4, he has what he calls, what is called the great Shema. And that word means hear. And it's, it's as though God is saying, pay attention. Are you listening? And here's what he says to listen to. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. When Jesus summarized the law, didn't he quote that? And then he goes on to say, These words which I am commanding you this day shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons when you sit, when you walk, when you lie down, when you rise up. In other words, you're not just supposed to teach your children the Bible Sunday mornings or around the dinner table or on the king-size bed. You're to teach your children regardless of what you're doing. I remember taking Travis to a movie, and at the end of the movie, Jesus was on the cross. It was a teaching opportunity. On the way home in the car, I said, you know, that was a great movie, but Jesus isn't on the cross. The cross is empty. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. I remember buying stamps out of a stamp machine, and I put in the coins, and the machine malfunctioned. And it went, choo -choo, choo -choo, choo -choo. and all of a sudden, I had a whole handful of stamps. And my first thought was, wow. This is my lucky day. <laughs> and then I looked down at those four-year-old eyes looking at me. And I thought, we have to make a trip to the post office to return those stamps. Because I can't teach him the Word of God, and I can't help him memorize the Word of God if I'm not living the Word of God, right? Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, children can memorize. The first verse Travis memorized, he was three, and the verse was, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or even think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory. Your children can learn Bible verses. And the great thing is, you'll learn when you teach them. In chapter 6, verse 20, he says, When your son asks you in time to come, saying, What do the testimonies, statutes, and judgments mean which the Lord your God commands you? We'll look in a second to see what those words mean. Then you're to say, We were slaves to Pharaoh. The Lord brought us out. But verse 23, He brought us out from there in order to bring us in to give us the land which He had sworn to our fathers. This is a spiritual principle. God did not take Israel out of Egypt, out of the bondage, for them to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years, did he? He took them out of Egypt to take them into Canaan, a land where he was going to live right in their very midst. 
You see, he did not deliver us from the bondage of sin for us to wander around in this world the rest of our lives either, did he? He delivered us to take us into a life where he's the very center. That's the principle. In chapter 7, verse 21, he gives us another principle through his teaching to these, this new generation. He had told them not to be afraid to go into the land. Verse 21 says, There'll be enemies in the land, but don't dread them. For the Lord your God is in your midst. He's a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will clear away these nations before you little by little. See, that's another principle. I'm sure that Israel would have loved to have gone marching right into the promised land and had it just like that. But when we come to the conquest books next week, we'll find they had some battles to fight. There were some enemies in the land. When you and I come into this new relationship, we have some enemies in our land too, don't we? And we don't get to be holy and righteous and pure just like that, although we'd love it. We have these enemies to fight, and it happens little by little. As we study, as we apply, little by little. The second part of the book is that he gives them instructions for living in the land. He's repeating the law. Now, we had instructions, we had laws for Travis when he was little. The first law was, be, we called it a rule, be smart in your brain, not in your mouth. And we were willing to enforce that rule. And of course, he went to school, and after the first week, he knew everything. <laughs> he had been rather mouthy for a week, and I have a very patient husband. But finally, at the end of one week, he said, that's enough, young man. He took him by the arm, marched him up the steps, smacked us behind a few times on the way up, put him in the bed. And as Bob was walking out of the room, Travis said, thanks, Dad. I love you. <laughs> Bob came downstairs with tears in his eyes and he said, he thanked me. But you see, God loves us enough not only to give us rules for our good. He said the law was for our good. He loves us enough to enforce those rules. And when you look at the other side, you see, if I love him, my heart should be broken when I break the rules just like Travis's was. He was sorry he had disappointed his father. Our hearts should be broken when we disobey God's laws. If you look in your workbook, the first one is religious law. This had to do with their relationship with God, how they were to worship, how they were to celebrate feasts, the second law, kind of laws, were national laws. These were for the nation. These were things like, how do we punish lawbreakers? How do we go to war, rules for warfare? There were even laws for kings, that if they were to have a king, and listen to this one, because we'll, they'll break it later. Kings were not to have multiple wives. That law is in here. And we'll find that, that breaking that law gets them in trouble. And the third kind of laws were personal laws. These are called testimonies. Do you see, religious were statutes, national were judgments, and personal were testimonies. The testimonies or personal laws were, were just that. They were things, laws to talk about foods and finance and families. Chapter 13 actually gives us a good illustration of the religious laws or the instructions on how to live in the land. God knew that they would have a lot of people claiming to be spokespeople for God, just like we do today. How will we know who to listen to? Chapter 13, verse 1. If a prophet or dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and that sign or wonder comes to pass, and yet that same person says, let's go after other gods whom you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to that prophet because God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Verse 5 says, that prophet shall be put to death. This is very important because if someone performed a miracle today, we'd be pretty impressed, wouldn't we? 
And we would think we should listen to them. Surely this must be from God. But he says that's not an evidence that someone is from God. The evidence is who are they pointing you to? Are they pointing you to Jesus? Are they pointing you to the one true God or to another way, another truth, another book? He says, miracles are not proof that someone is a prophet from God. In chapter 18, he continues with this discussion of spiritual things. And I, the reason I think this is so important is we live in a spiritual age, don't we? Everybody is spiritual. Look at verse 9. He says, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. And then he makes a list of what those detestable things are. Do not practice divination, witchcraft, omens, sorcerers, go to mediums or spiritists or those who call up the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. Boy, these things may be detestable to the Lord, but they're not detestable in the world today, are they? You open up magazines or turn on your TV, you can have your palm read, your astrology chart done, or call up the dead. Now, I understand why people want to do that. Because we are not living, obeying God's law. People die, and we have unresolved issues, right? And so we think, boy, if I could just talk to them one more time to make sure things are all right between us. So we want to call up the dead, and God calls that detestable. Now, he does say in verse 15 that there is a prophet coming. He says, God will raise up a prophet, and it will be from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. And verse 18, God says, I'll put my words in his mouth. And the New Testament tells us that that was a prophecy of Jesus, that he was from their country. He was a Jew. He had God's words in his mouth, and we are to listen to him. And the book of Acts chapter 3 says that he may send Jesus the Christ, appointed for you, about which God spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, the Lord shall raise up for you a prophet. You see, that, that verse is saying Jesus was the fulfillment of this prophecy. He is the true prophet. Verse 22 actually gives us one last test of a prophet, and that is a prophet of God is accurate 100% of the time. That eliminates a lot of prophets we have today, doesn't it? The rest of the book is dealing with choices. The first part was remembering the past. That was, was historical. The second part was legal. It was instructions for the future repeating the law. In this last section, he talks about personal things, choices. He talks about the departure of the leader, Moses, but actually there's a lot in here for us to apply as well. For example, chapter 28 talks about blessing and cursing for obedience and disobedience. He says, if you're blessed, if you obey, you'll be blessed. If you disobey, you'll be cursed. Chapter 30, verse 19, is our memory verse. And he talks about the importance of our choices. Verse 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice. Look how many times loving and obeying have been in the same verse. And he says we're to love him with all our heart. But it's a choice, right? It is a choice. Now, the book ends reminding us that Moses made the wrong choice. Now, remember in the book of Exodus, God had said to Moses, when the people were thirsty, strike the rock and water poured out. In the book of Numbers, God said, speak to the rock. But Moses got angry and he struck the rock twice. Chapter 32, he tells Moses in verse 48 that he would go up on a mountain and look into the promised land, but he was not going to get into the land. He was to look into the land and then die. 
and in your workbook you can fill in those blanks. He was to look into the land, but he would die. And verse 51 tells us why he was going to die. Because you broke faith with me, because you did not treat me as holy. You see, when he disobeyed God, he broke faith with God. He did not treat God as holy. And it doesn't sound like that big a deal to us. But when we come to the New Testament, the rock is Jesus Christ. He was struck for our sins and the water of the Holy Spirit poured out. Jesus didn't have to be struck twice, only once. The second time, we have to speak to Jesus. He was struck once for us and then we speak to him. Moses did not treat God as holy. He disobeyed and he did not get to go into the land. He made the wrong choice. The application of this book is very clear, isn't it? Our obedience or disobedience impacts not only us, but future generations. But another point is just because you're born in a barn doesn't, or garage doesn't make you a car, isn't that the saying? Well, just because you're born in a godly family doesn't make you godly either. It's a matter of choices. That's what he to he's told us. Our obedience or disobedience impacts future generations, but he's told us to love him and obey him. But we need to love him with all our heart. That's my question to you. Do you love him with all your heart?